All right, how's it going, everybody? Josh, KI6NAZ from the Ham Radio Crash Course. I'm here with Kevin Laughlin, and what makes it great about Kevin Laughlin is that is exactly what his YouTube channel is. So if you want to find him, the link will be in the description. He's the old tech guy, uh, KB6RLW, and I, I ran in... Oh, KB9. K, see, I'm so used to six land, California, <laughs> uh, six land. KB9RLW, right. Uh, I, I ran into some recent trouble as some of you might have saw in one of my live streams, and it was about my little QRP amp. And sure enough, I had been following Kevin's videos as I kind of did a, a review of the same amp, and I didn't watch his last video. And that last video was a, was a key piece of information, uh, very important to, to getting the whole thing up and running. So, of course, I went back and watched it, and Kevin and I exchanged some messages, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, but we're going to have a little bit of open-ended discussion ham radio fun as well. So, Kevin, thanks for joining me out here. Yeah, sure, Josh. Hello, YouTubers and fellow hams. I had to say it. Yeah, so make sure you do subscribe to Kevin. Again, link will be in the description. So, Kevin, you have the, the same amp as I did, or I think, did you pick it up on eBay? That's where I got it. Yeah, yeah, I got it on eBay as well. So it was like I, I'd seen it, uh, I'd seen it um, over in the desert uh, last winter. A friend of mine picked one up, and I thought, ah, this is a great little idea. When you're talking about the desert, are you talking about Quartz Fest? No, this was uh, the Yuma. I, oh. I spend the entire winter season down here in the southwest corner of Arizona. We will definitely talk about uh, what, what you got going on, because you're living kind of a, a ham radio dream for a lot of people. So you found out a problem. Well, not a problem, but just kind of a, you know, this thing is $110 for this amp, right? It puts out about yep. 40 watts, 50 watts. And you just kind of stumbled on kind of some robustness issues that you could build into the amplifier itself and also its keying mechanism. And so I was curious if you could maybe break that down right up front. Well, yeah, I think that's one of the same issue was the keying uh, because the uh, the amplifier doesn't have any kind of um, driver for the relays inside of it. It actually brings the, the power from the relays right out to the keying line. So your radio has to sync the entire current of the relays in switching the amplifier. Right. Uh, which I ran into a problem with this little uh, Chinese knockoff of the MCHF that I've got. It, it, it couldn't sync enough current to key the amp, and that's how I discovered the problem. So I just made a single transistor relay driver to put in the amp, so you really only need to sync about one milliamp of current through the radio instead of uh, 38. Yeah, I also noticed you put it a, a reverse bias diode too, right? Wasn't that something you did? It's just a protection kind of thing? Well, yeah, actually the diode should go across the relay coil because that's where the transient comes from. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to take the entire amp apart and desolder because uh, you have to desolder the input-output connections and, and deal with the uh, final amps and the way they're mounted. I didn't want to mess with all that to, just to put the diode in. So uh, the transistor was what I was worried about. It didn't spike across the, the power rail in that transistor. It goes through the diode instead of the junction of the transistor. So I lost you at, uh, you put the transistor in, so I think I lost part of that. Just you, you cut out for a second. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm on cellular network, so my okay. bandwidth is kind of limited. It's okay, um, I, can cut, I can cut little chunks of this. It's not a big deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. But what I was saying was that, that you generally would put the reverse bias diode across the relay coil because that's where the transient spike comes from when the magnetic field collapses. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't want to take the entire amplifier apart and tear it all down just to do that. So I put it across the transistor, which was what I was worried about, was the junction on that transistor. So it, it's not the ideal way to do it, but it does provide some protection for that switching transistor. Yeah, so I, I found that really interesting, and that's exactly what my experience was when I was doing the live stream. And, and oddly enough, I, I have I have a couple radios. I think you've got the same situation. The thing was kind of designed for the 817, I believe, the Yesu, and it doesn't seem to have any problem with it. I put it on a KX2, worked fine. I had another radio, QRP radio, couldn't key it, and then obviously I put the 705 on it, and after I looked at the pinout and, and kind of probed with the multimeter, it's, it's not syncing it, and that's exactly what the problem is, is it can't really, because basically it's just a short to ground, right? Isn't that kind of how the, the, wire, yeah. the keying wire works? Yeah, yeah, and usually um, your radio will have basically what I did. It should have like a transistor in there that that closes the circuit to ground. Um, some radios might even have a relay or mm -hmm. another component to, to do it. So I don't know what they're doing on the 705. I don't know what they're doing on the MCHF that would not be able to sync 38 milliamps of current for the relays. Mm -hmm. But still, in my mind, if it's a control line, it shouldn't be carrying current. It should be carrying a, a voltage signal. You know? Yeah, and, and that's basically what my mod did was was no longer requires any real current across that line to, to do the key. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good point, and, and that might also be a byproduct of it being 
one hundred and ten dollars, right, for the whole. Thing. Oh, it's a so, cheap design. Yeah, yeah, it's a cheap design. He, he definitely cut corners there. Yeah, I, I think you also tapped in on something I, I found interesting. Uh, I got the same questions you did. Of, of course, I was following your videos. Uh, that the uh, the purity of the signal. A lot of people dived in on that, and I think what you discovered is that if you if you don't not even overdrive it, but if you don't take it kind of to its upper limit, it seems to be fine, right? Was that yeah, kind of what you experienced? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, up to about 2.5 watts of drive, it was fairly linear. Mm -hmm. And then once you got above 2.5 up to, to 5, instead of that output power rising in a linear fashion, it did that because right. you're, not, you're not getting the same percentage of increase in output that you're getting on the input, and that compression leads to distortion. Right. So I don't drive mine with more than two and a half watts, and I get 35 watts out of it at that point, which is, you know, the extra 15 or 10 or 15 watts that you'd get by pushing it a little harder is not going to make much of a difference, really. Yeah, and I've had decent success with it, uh, just playing around with a couple of different radios. It's worked fine uh, with, you know, mobile antennas, and obviously I've put it on my Step IR, and, and that seems to be doing some of the heavy lifting. But I was just saying that, um, by and large, I think that it's it's kind of priced right for the value option. But with the addition of the circuit that you made, I think it makes it a little bit more universal for different radios. And I mean, is there a safety aspect to this as well? Since you're putting, since it's putting out the voltage on the keying line, is there any concern on you know how you connect it to the radio when it's off and on? If you just throw it in there, would there be any problems with that? Not at all. Uh, I actually had a couple of guys comment when I first put the video out there, gee, if that transistor ever shorts, you're going to blow your radio. And I said, no, if that transistor ever shorts, you'll be in exactly the same state you were in when the amp was new. The relays are still in line. They're still there limiting current. So it, if the transistor ever shorted, it would be just like the transistor wasn't there, and you're just back to the old situation with the keying line. Right. So th that's what I mean, though. The keying line uh, with the, the voltage being over the keying line, is there any concern that that could damage a radio just in its stock form? No, because that's pretty much the way that that, that, that whole mechanism works. Right. Uh, in, in any amplifier, what it's doing is it's looking for the radio to ground a signal level, which is going to mm -hmm. be a voltage. And right. what, you're doing, what we're doing is limiting that current that's going through that loop. So that uh, resistor that I put in line with the base, or actually the resistor that I used to bias the base on that transistor was 10K. So at uh, 12 volts, that's like 1.2 milliamps, right. you know, which is nothing. Um, so, yeah, no, no worries at all about damaging your radio. Very good. Very good. Well, you know, I, I kind of want to open it up a little bit now. I'm, I'm interested to kind of know a little bit about your backstory. You obviously have um, skilled with uh, the electronic design of some of these circuits. You cooked up this circuit on your own. How did you kind of get started? For, you know, the people watching my channel, a lot of people are starting out, or a lot of people are, are proficient in certain aspects of radio, but, you know, they're looking to, to take on other aspects. And electrical design is kind of something I think a lot of people start thinking about as they get a little bit deeper into the hobby you know how did you get to where you're at today and then now looking kind of forward how would you recommend people start to learn about electrical engineering or whatever with you know applicability to ham radio well in my case i was one of those kids um i was making my own spaceships out of cardboard boxes and wiring up batteries and light bulbs and grabbing my dad's old oscilloscope off his bench and sticking it there with a microphone so I could watch the trace dance when I talked into it. Hello, NASA, we're coming down on the moon, you know, I was when I was like 10 and 11 years old. So I've just always played around with it. Um, one of the best things, the best toys I ever had when I was a kid, and I wish they still made it, because even as an adult, it would be a worthwhile toy, was the Radio Shack 101 Electronics Project Kit. It was a they, great little... Go ahead. I was going to say, they have something like it, but it's not... As, as robust as the Radio Shack kit. It's called Snap Circuits. Have you heard of it? Yes. Yeah, it's similar. That's, that is similar, and that's not a bad idea. Yeah. If you want to get into classic electronics, I mean, it looks like a kid's toy, but really going through those exercises in there, you begin to understand how components work and, and how ele electronics work. And uh, once you get those basics down, you know, what a transistor is, how it works, what it does, what a resistor is, what a diode is, and all that, once you start to grasp that, then the more complex stuff begins to make a little more sense, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, of course, integrated circuits, computers and digital is a whole nother realm. Right. Um, but that can be explored as well with other things that are out there. It's a stepping stone, right? You kind of have to understand the discrete components before you start getting into the more complicated exactly. stuff, right? Because, because they're all built on top of each other. It's right. like with any with anything, you've got basic knowledge, and then the more advanced stuff is built on the basics. Right. So if you understand the basics, then it becomes easier to understand the more advanced. 
Yeah, so I guess you can't just shortcut it and go straight Arduino in a lot of cases, right? There's a little bit of background you should learn uh, before you just start throwing it in code. Well, <laughs> well yes and no. I mean, there are there's there's a great laptop I ran across. Um, I, I, I'll probably put a picture up of it here in the video on my video, uh, but it is an Arduino. Um, no, wait, wait, is it Arduino or is it Raspberry Pi? The Pi Top, the green one. It's the Pi Top, yeah. It's a Raspberry Pi, but you lift the keyboard off, and there's all these electronic modules and things under there, and springs yep. to hook things up with, and everything. Um, so that's kind of interesting. You get a little bit of the electronics with that one, but you also get the digital side of it and learning how to write Arduino code or, or uh, Python code, um, which, by the way, is not that hard. I mean, I've done several projects with Arduino and and that, and I really had never programmed them before when I first did um, my Arduino box. I don't know if you've seen that one, my rig yep. interface. Yeah, I, I I entered into that never touching an Arduino before, and uh, over the weekend I had learned enough about coding it to write the software for it. So they're they're very easy to work with. Yeah, I actually have one of those Pi Tops, and I've I've used it with my kids or my oldest son. He's a little bit more age appropriate for it. It comes with a whole like wealth of projects that you can do, and it it really for everybody that's familiar with the Raspberry Pi, it has those GPIO pins on it. You're highly leveraging the GPIO pins and you're doing a lot of Python. But the uh, the IDE, which is the what is it, integrated development or environment or development environment? Integrated development environment, yes. Yeah. So that whole uh, system is very kind of approachable for, for younger people and people just starting out. It's not too kiddish, but it's a cool little kit. I, I what I would like to see them do, I don't know if they've done it, is if they've upgraded it for the Pi four yet. I have it for the Pi three, but Interested to see what they do with that, but yeah, that's a great tip. Well, it's you know it's an incremental upgrade to the Pi Four. It's not a lot different with it. It's just a little faster and has more mm -hmm. memory options. Yeah, for sure. And so on. So going back a step, you you mentioned um, you you're building your spaceships growing up and you're attaching lights. That's super cool. A lot of kids did that. But you you, you mentioned something I think maybe um, maybe might help out too a little bit. You mentioned you grabbed your dad's oscilloscope. So you did have kind of access to a knowledgeable person growing up to a degree, right? Yes. Um, my dad was an engineer. Uh, he, uh, well, he was a mechanical engineer, but he okay. did do some stuff with electronics. He was into model railroading, and so he, he got into electronics through that because he started ah. building his own speed controllers for the, the train sets and, and the big layout and that. Um, and then I was getting interested in electronics about the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we kind of went through that together. Um, but he, he was not into ham radio. I got into ham radio and he followed me into the hobby to have something to do with his kid. He was, he was just that kind of a dad. Cool. Uh, oh, that's right. So, so it all kind of grew out of that. By the time I was 16, I was interested in radio and I had my license the next year. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then he got his license and, and I think after I moved out of the house, he didn't really do much with radio aside from go to the club meetings and picnics with the clubs and that was it. <laughs> but, uh. Good communities in a lot of cases with clubs that like that, you know, yeah. just getting out there with people, hanging out, it's always fun. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you got the radio uh, on in the background. <laughs> I forgot to turn the radio on, and I forgot to turn my audio recorder on, so the first half of this I don't have clean local audio. Hopefully the Skype audio is good. Oh, I hope, yeah. Mine sounded okay, so I, th I think we should be good. Um, yeah, so, boy, now I, I lost my train of thought I was going to, oh, yeah, of course. So you, you, the last couple of years, you've been kind of going into a, I don't want to, what would you call what you're doing right now? Your, your mobile home, or not mobile, um, RV mobile, if you will, right? It is Living a mobile home. Uh, it is a mobile home, actually, not, not just by, it is by definition. <laughs> I mean, I basically live in it. Um, yeah, well, I, uh, well, there's a whole series of events that led to me being here, but it's, sure. it's partially uh, desire and partially desperation. Um, I, when I lost the last job, I found out that once you get ab above 50 years old, it's very hard to get hired in the IT field. I know. Um, I went through about two years and 138 job applications and had two interviews in non IT positions and no lockouts otherwise. Wow. Uh, during that time, the YouTube channel at the encouraging of a friend of mine had gone mostly ham radio and had started to take off. Um, I guess people like my presentation style and, uh, yeah. uh, it just kind of grew and grew until I was making just enough money between YouTube and Patreon to pay my bills, but not enough for upkeep on the house. Right. And it was almost a hundred year old house that was going to be needing a new roof. The air conditioning had just failed. The furnace and water heater were 30 years old, still working, but 30 years old. The plumbing was starting to do that thing where they gets it gets pinholes that then rust through and you get those rust blisters all over the pipes, you know. And yep. so it's like, oh, that all has to be redone. And I realized that um, 
I really wasn't going to be able to afford to keep the house. Plus, my son, I was a single parent, and my son had grown up and moved out. And so I'm like, why am I still sitting here in this house? I'd really like to, to go out there and do some things and go some places. Uh, so it was kind of a, a mix of, well, I have to do something, and I'd like to do this. And yeah. uh, so I went ahead and just said, I'm just going to do it. And, uh, how, how has that changed your ham radio operating time? Has it been more fulfilling? Like when you're out, I assume you're going to some areas that are relatively more quiet. I don't know where you lived before, but I live in the suburbs, and oh my gosh, the RFI is choking. A lot more quiet. You get out in the desert, and uh, I, it, I could have my doublet up, a good antenna, and turn the radio on and think, am I connected to the antenna? I'm not sure. You know, cause it's, it's just like totally S0. flat. <laughs> yeah, it's S0. There's hardly any static, and then all of a sudden a signal comes blasting through. It can be that quiet. And, it's, and is it's that crazy. Is that kind of what it's like? Are you are you finding you're making more contacts, or it's it's more oh yeah consistent? I get you know consistency is a thing I always struggle with in ham radio is how to how to tell people to have a shack set up even if it's portable that they'll consistently make contacts with right and so I always kind of like say resonant antennas you know make it simple but do stuff that traditionally has worked but if you're giving yourself the leg up of also being in a quiet environment you're going to hear a lot more. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And weak signals are clearer, so you can actually work somebody that might have been down in the noise before. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as consistency goes, that all depends on the ionosphere and old Sol up there. Sure. So, you know, you're definitely in a situation like when I'm out there and I have a good antenna up on a decent mast. Um, I'm, in a, I'm in a situation where my side of the equation is fairly close to ideal. Right, you know, and then it's up to na it's up to nature as far as the rest of it goes. Absolutely, you're you're giving you're giving your setup the best chances, though. I guess to to make uh, yeah, to make much. decent contacts, you 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 know you're you're doing that whole thing. So you're you're fully portable, basically. Uh, all, everything you mm -hmm. can just go wherever you like. And so you you mentioned the desert, so you're hopping around kind of the southwest area generally. Well, in the winter, yeah, yeah. This okay. summer, I went up to Oregon. Um, ah. I'd met a couple of hams down in the southwest uh, last season that that owned a a hippie commune up in uh, Oregon. Um, <laughs> and I was like, well, that's a group of people I've always wanted to go hang out with for a while. So I went up there for a couple of months. Uh, and uh, there I was down in the river valley uh, with limited solar because of the trees. Sure. And uh, being down in the valley with the hills all around you, uh, HF radio was definitely a little bit different. Uh, you had that blocking effect of the hills and mountains. So it was yes. if a signal happened to be skipping in and coming down over the hills. Yeah, coming right at you almost, ooh, right? Right. So the bands were were much quieter <laughs> with much fewer signals that you could really hear because of that. Um, down here in the southwest, I'm in the in the desert where I can pretty much see the horizon in every direction. Oh, wow. And boy, does that that makes a huge difference when the bands are active here. It, it's just it's just crazy active. Do you ever drag out an Envis antenna when you're in situations like that, when you're kind of down in a lowland area surrounded by mountains? Yeah. Yeah, and that's what and kind of what I had set up up there in Oregon. Um, so on the lower bands, 80 meters and that, I had a pretty good localized footprint. Mm -hmm. I regularly talked to my friend Keith up in Vernonia, which was about three or 400 miles north. Um, we had a pretty good pipeline through Envis propagation. Um, okay. In a lot of HF antennas, unless you have a really, really good tower system or some pretty tall trees, you're somewhat Envis anyway. If that's true. If you have a true. 40 meter antenna that's less than a half a wave off the ground, it's going to be more upwards, you know. Yep. It's not a switch. It's, it's just a gradual transition, but it's going to be a little bit more upwards and less outwards. Yeah, they, what do they call that a cloud warmer. You got a cloud warmer in yeah. your hands if you're cloud if you burner, the... cloud warmer. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, yeah. So, what are what kind of antennas are you dragging out when you get set up? It sounds like you may have a mast of some kind. Uh, I, I know I've seen you with a, a loop. You did a, a couple videos on your loop antenna. Um, I have many videos on magnetic loops. I've yeah. built a lot of those. Um, I have a couple of different masts. I've got a 60-foot uh, spider beams mast that I put up once last year out in the desert. and looked ridiculous next to the RV. Uh, my favorite mast is the Max Gain Systems. I got a 33-foot mast. It's got those nice quick release clamps on it. Oh, so yeah. You, yep. you know, um, I can put that thing up by myself in uh, about a half an hour and have an antenna up on it. Um, my favorite right now is the doublet. Really? Okay. And so you're, um, what do you have that cut for? What's the design of it? Uh, it's, I'm, I'm actually going to lengthen it a bit. It's about a hundred and, um, about a hundred and nine feet, 110 feet total length right now. A doublet's not really designed to be a resonant antenna though. Sure. 
you know, it's it, you've got you've got a mismatch built into it where the feed line connects to the antenna, 300 to 400 ohms, and then about 74 ohms at resonance at the middle. So, it's not a resonant antenna by design. Right. You want it to be a pretty close to the length of the lowest frequency you want to operate on or longer. Okay. Now, are you running a feed line or a ladder line down to a window tuner? line? Yeah. You're okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I've yeah. I've got a four to one on the outside of the RV because I have a coax feed through connector on the wall. Right. And then about uh, three or four feet of coax down to the uh, switches and the radios. What are you generally running through that? Like 100 watts? Is that like through your 7300 or something? Oh, 100 watts is extreme QRO for me. I'm, I'm usually <laughs> around I'm usually around uh, 12, 15 watts. Uh, maybe I'll go up to 30 or so if somebody can't hear me. But uh, usually people can hear me pretty well at the lower power levels. That's what I was going to, my follow-on question is, you know, what radios have you been using? Because I, I, you know, obviously I watch your videos. So I've seen you 7300, and you've got the, mm-hmm. the, the China clone MIC-HF and uh, 817. And so that's, that's, it. that's pretty much everything you need, right? Pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. 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 Um, I, uh, I find myself using the little clone radio a lot for shortwave listening or basic communications just because it's a lower power draw. The 7300, through the middle of the day, um, sometimes into the evening, if I really need it, I might use it, but, uh, it's a power hog. So yeah, I'm on a minimal solar system. I've got about 280 Watts of solar and a 140 amp hour battery. Okay. Um, so that's modest, so but it'll work modest. fine with those Q- QRP radios. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Or if I want to use the laptop and, uh, and watch a couple of movies into the evening, I've, I've sat down and watched a couple of movies to almost midnight and still been at 12.6 volts on the battery. So yeah. Yeah, th- my power use is not that great. But you, I mean, you're if you're also down in Arizona, even in the winter, you, you're able to replenish that pretty quickly with your oh, yeah. panels, I assume. Yeah, like midday yeah, or so. Nothing's nothing's casting a shadow on me unless it's a really cloudy day. I've got plenty of sun, and even on the cloudy days, I get enough solar to use the laptop, make a few contacts on the QRP radio at QRP levels. Mm-hmm. But that's where that little amplifier came in. Um, yeah, the combination of of the small radio and that amplifier was. Uh, something like 42 percent lower power draw than what i was doing doing on the 7300 at the same power level output i think i did a test in one of the videos there and it was it was a big difference okay now uh okay so there was something i, I needed to go back and ask when you just mentioned that now i'm uh oh tuner i forgot to ask so you got a doublet so you're running it into a four to one that's coax mm-hmm. fed down and then you you probably have a tuner of some kind yeah i've got an lg uh okay. ldg z11 pro Okay, that's what I was curious about. So, yeah, yeah generally crazy. with the doublet, you need a tuner. Um, yep. Same thing with, like, yep. a G5RV. I know those are not the same antennas, uh, G5RVs no. and doublets, but same kind of similar, similar. concept. Yeah, kind of like you... a Wyndham is similar to those as well, but it's different. Right. Um, right. But, but, yeah, I do use the Balan. I've had a lot of comments from people saying, oh, you know, what's what's the 4 to 1 for? There's no impedance match. It's like, what? I, I'm bringing the high impedances of the antenna down so the tuner has to do less work. The, the closer right. the match that your tuner is dealing with, the less loss there is in the tuner. So it helps the efficiency of the system. Uh, that's pr- okay. Now I'm thinking about that. That's probably true. Yeah. So you're you're handling it physically through the Balan, the four to one. That's yeah. The impedances on them. the antenna, right? The impedances on the antenna by itself are all going to they're going to be all over the place because mm-hmm. it's a non-resonant antenna but mm-hmm. they're usually going to be high so that four to one ballon brings it down closer mm-hmm. to 50 ohms right and that means that the antenna tuner has less of a mismatch to deal with right so, so less loss in the tuner yeah okay yeah that makes sense yeah, yeah th- it's um so that's the primary antenna you use generally is the doublet and and you i mean you're obviously have no problem with it no, no, I love it. It's It's been a great performing antenna. I, I had one video where I had a contact in South Africa, Cape Town, near Cape Town, on oh, uh, yes. it's 17 meters. Yes, I did see that. It, so is that, um, so that takes you, what, uh, 40 through 10? 80 through 80. Uh, 6. Oh, 80 through 6. Okay. Yeah, very good. Yeah. yeah, the doublet works really well on the upper frequencies, you know, above where it's cut for. Uh, a traditional dipole, if you, if I just had a coax-fed, like, 80-meter dipole, you could use it on 40 meters. You could use a transmatch to get it on 20. Mm-hmm. But the the higher you went in frequency, the less well it seemed to work, and I think it's because of loss on the feed line. Mm-hmm. But with, with the doublet, there isn't as much loss on the feed line, and in the doublet video I talked about why. Uh, so those signals keep bouncing back and forth, but that, that keeps hitting the wires, so you still get more radiated power off the doublet than you would if you had a coaxial fed one. 
yeah, on the doublet video, I actually linked a couple of PDFs that, that went far more in depth into why it's a, a, a higher performance antenna. But in observation, just operating it, um, it definitely works better on the higher frequency bands than it's cut for than any other ante wire antenna that I've used. Now, I also have an end fed half wave for 160 meters um, that I've had up uh, that I had up, up in Oregon as well. And it works really well on 80 and 40 and 20. It starts mm -hmm. to fall off above 20. That's a long wire, 160. Yeah, very on long wire. Yeah. That's a nice I, thing about being out in the desert. Sure. Yeah, you can run it as far as you want. You can have all kinds of fun experimenting with different stuff with antennas. Yeah, that's very cool. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so I guess, oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, you know, I, I, that's fine. I, I just had a couple of things I was wanting to chat with you about, too. Oh, great. Um, you know, I was looking back through the history on your channel because it's, it's interesting. On, on the other ham radio guys that I've talked to, we all had the similar thing where our channel was family stuff or, or some other thing. And then eventually it sort of falls into and then sticks around the category of ham radio, which I noticed with you, you, you were doing videos for quite a while. I mean, you started really regularly doing videos about eight years ago. Yeah, and I actually started my channel in 2006, so it goes back a ways. Yeah, quite a ways. Um, yeah. But you really got active about five years ago, and then I think your first ham radio video that was titled uh, Ham Radio Crash Course, December was December 2015 was when you, when you did the first video that you said Ham Radio Crash Course. Yeah, it, it was before the name even changed. Yeah, how did you uh, come across the Ham Radio Crash Course as the name? I I don't know really. Um, so the at the time, I think it was roughly about the time I was doing daily vlogs, and yeah. so I was putting out a video like every day, and I was getting to the point where I was like, "Wow, this is really taxing to fit like a uh -huh. whole, like a, a you know ten to twenty minute video in in every one of your days gets really taxing," and so I was it's getting the point. Work. It is. I was getting to the point where I was like, "Well." You know, what am I most passionate about? What do, I, what do I care the most about? And it was definitely ham radio. So I started thinking, I was like, well, you know, maybe it would be fun to do, you know, a longer video and maybe a couple of videos in like a series to kind of help people get started in amateur radio. Not mm -hmm. the, the deepest technical content, but enough to get people to the point that they were learning, right? Or, mm -hmm. or experimenting a little bit more, right? Not just picking up a hand Yeah, that's kind of my driving force too. Yeah, you know, not just hitting a repeater, talking to a couple people, calling it a day, charge the thing and rinse and repeat. You know, a little bit a little bit more to it. So I put together a couple videos and I was like, well I'll just call it a crash course. It's just a crash course and like here's a throwing you in the deep end a little bit. Here's a couple of quick ideas to get you started and then we'll go from there. But I kept oh, yeah. the channel name Hosh Nasi until two years ago, a year and a half. And so that was like the big conversion. October uh, 2017. Oh, so even I, I more. think was when you really switched over to ham radio because then nearly all of your videos were ham radio. Yeah, yeah, big big shift at that point, big changes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, do you uh, do you ever randomly get recognized in public? Specifically at the HRO, yes. <laughs> well, I, I, I've had a couple of people out and about. Um, maybe two or three people have have said like hey do you or or they'll have like a ham you know it'll be like a ham radio thing we'll just be two hams that kind of pass each other and like hey right, right. You, do you do you do the videos and i'm like oh yeah oddly enough i've had people at work message me uh, and they're like hey is are you the same guy and i'm like yeah um, that's me and and so that's always interesting <laughs> where do you work uh i work for a large aerospace company that's all i that's all i throw out i'm, I'm a software engineer okay by trade no, that's fine that's no fine. yeah I totally understand. You've got to keep your YouTube persona and life a little bit isolated because there are some psychos out there. <laughs> sure, yeah, and, you know, just work obligation stuff like that where it's like, you know, I'm not going to talk about anything work-related on my channel ever, uh, ever, ever. But, you know, people are curious, and so I always just say I'm a software engineer. I work in aerospace type stuff. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, no, I, I get that too because you definitely don't want to. It's, it, there's such a big gray area around it that you just don't want to even stick a finger out into because it could come back to bite you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and ham radio is not really adjacent to any of that stuff anyway. So it's like, hey, no big deal. <laughs> I think. Right. Yeah. You're safe. <laughs> Do you get a lot of success stories from viewers and comments or um, feedback where, hey, you're, you helped me solve this problem or you helped me uh, do this or I did this because I was encouraged? At least once a day. 
if not more. Yeah. And it's uh, so what happened, and I can make this quick, but at a certain point, I was getting so slammed with email and messages that I couldn't actually make videos. <laughs> it was just crazy. So I created the Hammer to Crash Course Facebook group, and then I had some really smart younger people say, hey, you should really make a Discord. And I'm like, what's a Discord? And that, we just passed 10,000 members on a Discord. And those communities kind of filled some of the void so that I could get back some of my time to make videos. But, you know, every day on those groups, I get messaged every day there. And then I get emails uh, on my personal or my, my channel's email address, you know, help, you know, thanks or Instagram all the time. Mm -hmm. Happens all the time. Makes you feel good, doesn't it? It does. It really does. You know, I started out kind of doing this because I absolutely love radio. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy doing it. You know, personally passionate about it. But then I started realizing it's like, oh, no, this is actually like helping the hobby. And it's all of us, right? Everybody on YouTube that, that creates content in ham radio is helping the hobby grow and find new people. Yeah. It, it's fantastic for that. Yeah, yeah, and and you're kind of energizing people too. I've always enjoyed I, years and years. I I would help more people at the clubs or whatever, help somebody out if they had questions or whatever. I'd you know help them help them find the answer or or you know I wouldn't just in a lot of cases I wouldn't just give them the answer. I'd sort of lead them along, you know, because that yeah. way it's like the old proverb: if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. If you teach a man to fish, he'll eat for life. Um, same kind of idea. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, it kind of validates your work when you get those those bits of feedback from people yeah and actually uh you know you're on youtube i'm on youtube a lot of people are on youtube we get rough comments a lot and oh yeah <laughs> and so i i've got i don't know how i i don't know where this came from probably it's just from being on youtube for so long but i started kind of just not focusing on the words they were saying and the point of the comment a lot of comments you could just throw away but some comments even the ones that are negative there's kind of some value to be gleamed off of that and so i always just kind of look at that and go like oh that's something i could probably make a video about or that's something i could you know make a correction to a follow-on something like that so even the the negative feedback i try and turn it into something positive and that seems to help a lot i've made really popular videos just from negative comments <laughs> i've done similar um you know and it really depends on the commenter too and how they word it you know yeah. okay are they giving me an honest critique or are they just spouting off because you get yeah. an awful lot of the spouting off and, and just ignore those. <laughs> I always I always try to do the benefit of the doubt thing where because I don't know the tone that they're writing the, the message in. The I just of text. Yeah, I just assume that they're not being jerks, at least, you know, until they prove it without a shadow of a doubt after a couple of replies or whatever. So most of the time I just try and take it in, in stride. Yeah, that's the best way to handle it, you know, because you, you never know. They might just be really bad at asking questions. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, true, true. All right. Um, uh, that's really pretty much all that I had li uh, lined up to ask you. Yeah, no, this is good. This is like 30 minutes or so. This is perfect. So I'll, oh, I'll, okay. I'll, throw one, I'll throw one last question at you since we, you know, before we went live, quote unquote, with our video, uh, we had a brief Star Trek. Uh, oh. you know, just, what was your favorite season? Or not season. Uh, what did they call that? Uh, run of Star Trek, you know? The original, uh, Next Generation, what was your favorite? Oh, gosh. Well, the original series, I was a kid, so it was a different kind of fascination. You know, right. I mean, I really enjoyed it, but it was with the, the wide eyes and easy um, imagination of a child, you know? And I, right. I absolutely loved it. Um, the Planet Killer episode, um, remember that one with the, uh, the uh, Doomsday Machine? I am <laughs> not well-versed in the original series. I've seen about... 25% of them, and I don't know if that's the one. It was an episode with a, what looked like a, a windsock with concrete on it that was eating planets and then went after the Enterprise. Scared okay. the heck out of me as a kid. I had nightmares about that thing as a kid, you know? Um, looking at it now, it looks a little campy, but it's still a good show. Um, the Next Generation, I guess, would probably be my favorite series. Followed closely by Enterprise. I don't know what I liked about Enterprise, but I just uh -huh. there was something about Enterprise that I liked. I didn't um, expect in that. the original series. I didn't expect Enterprise really? to be your second. Yeah, no, I didn't really like Enterprise. But I have a really weird top. My favorite is Deep Space Nine. So 
You know, oh, I'm, a really? bit, I'm a bit on the weird end of things. Yeah, I, I, did you get all yeah, the way through that there series? Was a, there was there was a lot of interesting characters in there. You know, the security guard and uh, Odo. Yeah, of course, Quark and uh, Cisco was a, was a good commander. You know, and Nana Visitor as uh, Kira, 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 uh, Kira. Yeah, name? yeah, she was yeah, the she was, Bajoran, right? The Bajoran. Bajoran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was she was very pretty. I I, I always found her attractive. Did you and, get through the whole series? Attitude. Did yeah. you get through the whole thing? So when the whole thing turns, because it's very like uh, episodic in the beginning, right? It's just like, who's the villain yeah, of the week? Story every, the week different the, story every episode. Yeah. But when the Dominion War kicks off, it almost becomes a completely different show. So yeah. I always really liked that. And that's where Cisco like really became like one of my favorite captains, for sure. The way he handled that whole thing was gnarly. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know that was like you say it went from episodic to having a a, a season story arc. You know, and yeah. it, it gives you something to look forward to the next week. You know, it's like I wonder what's going to happen with that story. Yeah. Plus, you got little subplots each week. You know that. You know what's what stupid thing is Quark going to do this week? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plus, that's the introduction of the Defiant, which is my favorite starship in the in the Federation because it's not a, it's not at all for science or diplomacy it's just straight up killing the Borg that's why it was designed so it's like stripped down it's almost like a naval attack submarine but in right. space and it's just purely for killing military Borg. vessel purely military I was like oh that's cool that's super cool so yeah that was that was my favorite for sure yeah all right <laughs> had to throw that in so, at the so, end just to so lighten yeah, it up we're both nerds yeah, well, you know, nerds is nerd is a cool thing now. My wife was telling me that uh, she's like, you know, being a nerd's cool now. It's cooler than it's ever been. I'm like, yeah, it's, I guess that's a good point. So, I'll take it. <laughs> As the more technological society becomes, the more uh, prem, uh, premium nerds will become. That's right. Very good, Kevin. This has been a blast. Uh, thanks so much for for hop hopping on the channel here, helping me out even before we talked uh, with that amp. Everybody, do again. Go, go sub to Kevin, watch his stuff. Really good stuff, really smart, a lot of technical depth there. Um, but given in a way that I think is highly approachable, which is, you know, kudos to you for being able to do that. Well, thank you, Josh. I appreciate that. And, uh, yeah, your channel's got a lot of variety to it, too. I'm going to be sending people your way, too. Pretty well presented. It's, you know, clear and nice, nice production value. Thank you very much. I, I do strive for that as well. So anyway, everybody, thanks for watching. And again, make sure to go sub to Kevin. Sub to me too while you're at it if you haven't already. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so I'm Josh, KI6NAZ, and we've got Kevin Laughlin, KB9RLW. So I Kilo got Kilo Bravo 9, random long wire. Rant, there you go. Okay, so 7-3 then, I guess we'll say to everybody. Oh, yeah, we'll do that. There you go. <laughs> Bye. You can do both. Can we do both? Yeah, we can do both. <laughs> oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.